All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So welcome, everyone. My name is Elena Kidd, and I'm a program director with the University of Alabama at Birmingham School of Public Health. And we are very excited to welcome you to today's webinar, the ABCs of Viral Hepatitis, Update for Public Health Professionals featuring Barb DeBron from Sinusure Health. This webinar is made possible by the Alabama Regional Center for Infection Prevention and Control and Training Assistance Center, or ARC-IPC. The ARC-IPC was established to meet the consultation and support service needs surrounding infection prevention and control throughout the state of Alabama. The center is a collaborative effort of the Alabama Department of Public Health Inf um, Infectious Disease and Outbreaks Division and the University of Alabama at Birmingham. The ARC IPC provides training and technical assistance to infection prevention and control and public health professionals in areas needed to detect, respond to, control, and prevent infectious disease outbreaks. You can learn more about the center, view, and listen to past trainings, webinars, and podcasts, request training and technical assistance, and view infection prevention and control resources at uav.edu slash arcipc. You can also email arcipc at uav.edu with any questions. We'd like to thank our co-sponsors for today's webinar, the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety and the Region 4 Public Health Training Center. You can learn more about their programs and the centers as a whole at their websites listed on this slide. We'd also like to invite you to our next webinar on November 1st, Protect and Preserve, Priorities of Antimicrobial Stewardship, featuring Dr. Matthew Brown. As you know, antimicrobials are essential for modern medicine. However, they become less effective over time. In addition, adverse effects and other negative consequences of antimicrobial use are not uncommon. This presentation, in this presentation, Dr. Matthew Brown will provide an overview of antimicrobial stewardship and how it can help protect patients and preserve the utility of these important medications. This webinar will also be presented by ARC IPC and co-sponsored by the Region 4 Public Health Training Center and the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety. Continuing education credits have been approved for nurses by the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety for this program. In order to receive credit for this training, you must register for the training, watch the entire program, and complete the evaluation following the program. Upon completion of the evaluation, you will be redirected to the Alabama Nursing CEU request form, which you will also need to complete. CEUs will be awarded by the Deep South Center for Occupational Health and Safety. You do not have to submit directly to the Alabama Board of Nursing. CEU units for this program will expire on October 18th, 2023. If you experience any issues or have any questions about the continuing education credits, please email arcipc at uav.edu or arcipc at uav.edu with any questions. We will place this email in the chat box as well. And finally, it's my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Barb DeBron has over 40 years of experience in the field of infection prevention and quality improvement. She is currently an improvement advisor with Sinusure Health, where she provides vision and leadership in development, implementation, and facilitation of infection prevention and quality improvement initiatives for healthcare organizations. Previously, she was an improvement advisor for Beacon, the Bay Area Patient Safety Collaborative, and she was the Director of Patient Safety and Infection Control at California Pacific Medical Center in San Francisco. Barb is a certified infection control practitioner and holds a bachelor's degree in nursing from Pace University in New York and a master of science degree in nursing from San Francisco State University. Barb has served two years as an elected member of the APIC Board of Directors. Prior to her board service, she served as APIC's liaison to the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control's Hospital Infection Control Practices Advisory Committee. Barb has lectured nationally and internationally on a variety of patient safety and infection control topics and has published over a dozen articles and several book chapters. In 2008, she was selected as Infection Control Today's Educator of the Year. So without further ado, it is my pleasure to turn things over to Barb DeBron. Elena, thank you. It's really, uh, I was really delighted that you asked me to cover this topic because Hepatitis, there's, there have been so many things that have changed over the years. And uh, in preparation for this, I actually learned a lot. There were th many things that I wasn't up to date on. So I appreciate the invitation because it challenged me to actually 
uh, learn some stuff, which is always a good thing. So uh, let me just kind of set the stage by describing the term hepatitis, because it's really important for us to understand that what hepatitis means is it's really just inflammation of the liver. And we know the liver is a very important and a very busy organ. It processes all kinds of nutrients. It filters the blood. Uh, it helps fight infections, uh, but it can be easily very compromised. And we know there are many things that can cause hepatitis. So it doesn't have to be a virus. It could be uh, increased alcohol use. It could be a toxin. Uh, could be some medications are, are not kind to the liver. Uh, but in the United States, most people who have hepatitis have viral hepatitis. So I'm going to break this down uh, into the ABCs, uh, a, hepatitis A, hepatitis B, and hepatitis C, and just go over some of the basic fundamentals. I'm going to share some data that I was able to pull off the CDC website. And I'm really hoping uh, that we'll have time at the end because I would love to hear from all of you who work in the field uh, what particular challenges you've had with regards to uh, hepatitis prevention, uh, management and treatment in the state of Alabama. So this is just a nice kind of summary um, that showcases the, the three main types of viral hepatitis. And what's interesting about this virus is that these, well, these viruses, I should say, uh, they're really very different. Um, they don't share a lot in common uh, the hepatitis A virus uh, is spread very different from B and C. So it's spread fecal oral person to person versus blood or sexual transmission. Incubation periods are very, very different. You can see hepatitis A has a pretty short incubation period, and that's the period from exposure to onset of symptoms. That's typically less than a month, whereas hepatitis B is about three months. And hepatitis C is somewhere between 14 and 84 days. So it's kind of in, in the middle there. The symptoms are, are a mystery for some. There are some people that, that get viral hepatitis and have absolutely no symptoms. They don't even know that they have it. And that's particularly a problem with hepatitis C. And I'll, I'll get into that in greater detail. But the symptoms are similar and it can be any of these, jaundice, fever, fatigue, loss of appetite, nausea, vomiting, sometimes joint pain. The urine can get dark, the stool can get clay colored. There's all kinds of, there's all kinds of variation in, um, in, in infection. Um, there is not any mother to baby transmission with hepatitis A, but we know it can be a, a serious problem uh, with hep B and hep C. Uh, and yes, there's a vaccine for hep A and hep B, but not currently for hepatitis C. But then if you do the flip side, uh, even though there's no vaccine for hepatitis C, there are current treatments that can in fact cure a person of the infection, which is really pretty exciting because for many, many years, people were diagnosed with hepatitis C and there was nothing we could do for them other than put them on the transplant waiting list. So that's, that was kind of it. That's kind of an exciting progression. Uh, and so that's just kind of a, a snapshot of the three different, the main, the main hepatitis uh, viruses. So I wanted to let you know, there's a, there's a ton of great resources out there. And one of them that I just wanted to showcase for you are these little, these quick little videos that describe how to interpret the serology. Because for some of the serologies, like especially with hepatitis B, it can get kind of confusing differentiating between surface antigen, surface antibody, core antibody, and all that stuff. So I would encourage you um, to click on the link in, these, in, in the slide deck and you'll be able to listen to these really nice overviews uh, describing how to interpret the serology. So let's start at the beginning of the alphabet. We're gonna start with hepatitis A. So um, this is the, da the data that I pulled from the CDC website, very recent. So this is, this is as recent as the data is uh, currently uh, through 2020. And a couple things in, as, as public health professionals, you know this better than anybody in that the reported cases are always way lower than the estimated infections. We know there are a ton of conditions and cases that never even get reported to, uh, to public health. So when you look at this slide, you can see that the line is the actual reported cases and you can see how it blipped up significantly in 2019 and then started coming down but when you look at the actual estimated cases, much, much higher than what's actually been reported. And 
we know that that's, this, this can be a true challenge because sometimes we think that we're doing better than we are because we think about COVID right now. Think about how many people test, you know, do a home test for COVID and it's positive, but they don't have any reason to let their physician know because they're, you know, they're not that sick and those cases don't get reported. So when we take a look, um, the, the now, Alabama, because you're, because this is alpha, alpha order, this isn't highest to lowest in terms of case rate, but since Alabama is the very beginning of the alphabet, you're always number one when it comes to this. So you can look at the cases of hepatitis A over time, and they really haven't, there hasn't been, there really wasn't that much of a variation until, I'm just going to move this out of the way so I can see this, until you look over here at 2020, and there was a huge bump in, in Alabama, uh, 2020, huge bump in hep for hepatitis A. Other states too, but specifically uh, Alabama saw a significant increase. And then this is just a chart that compares year 2020 to, to year 2019. And you can see uh, 2020 in Alabama, you had a lot more cases of hepatitis A uh, as compared to 2019. It's gonna be really interesting how this kind of washes out because you know, we all know some significant stuff happened in the year 2020. And the fact that anything got reported, <laughs> quite frankly, is, is, is kind of a good thing because most of us were pretty consumed uh, with dealing with the early days of the, of the uh, COVID pandemic. So it's just important to kind of be able to look at your data and get a sense of uh, where things are at in your state. So in terms of risk factors for hepatitis A, um, as you can see, what's interesting, um, the, when, when we looked at patients who developed hepatitis A in the United States in 2020, you can see that injection drug use was a risk, was a, was a patient characteristic. And this ties together a lot with the homelessness, um, lack of, of, of safe housing connection where a lot of people were living on the street using IV drugs uh, because we know it's not a bloodborne pathogen. It's not something that's spread through injection, but this was a risk factor in terms of potentially there was some kind of person-to-person, skin-to-skin kind of contact where people might have gotten it that way. So let's just kind of go through the basics. Hepatitis A transmission is spread typically when we have to eat poop, literally we have to ingest fecal matter. And the important thing here is even a tiny amount. Uh, so hepatitis A, highly, highly transmissible. You don't have to be exposed to a ton of it. So if we eat something, if we eat food that's been contaminated or we get our hands, we touch something that's contaminated and we stick our hands in our mouth, uh, we can get infected uh, pretty easily uh, from person to person. Now, the course of infection for hepatitis A, um, some people don't have any symptoms uh, the symptom, or the symptoms can be mild or they can be significant uh, and they can last anywhere from a few weeks to several months. The, probably the best news about hepatitis A is even though people can get really sick uh, and feel like they're gonna die, usually they don't. Uh, most people recover from hepatitis A with no lasting or chronic liver damage so there isn't a chronic carrier state with hepatitis A, which is very different from B and C. And yes, death can occur, but it's extremely rare. So that's kind of the, the good news about hepatitis A. Again, the highest risk groups are people that are either using drugs, whether it's injectable or non-injectable. Uh, what we saw, especially in, tw in, in 2020, a lot of people with unstable housing or without homes living on the street uh, men who have sex with men, uh, people that are either currently or were recently incarcerated, and then people with just chronic liver disease or cirrhosis, hep B or hep C. So these are the highest risk groups for hepatitis A. So how do we prevent it? Well, as public health professionals, you all know that, that the vaccines are the key, that getting people vaccinated for vaccine preventable diseases is where we need to focus a ton of energy and effort. Uh, but we also know that when there was this horrific outbreak, especially in 2020, that when they did a really good job getting one just dose, one single dose of single antigen hepatitis A vaccine, they were able to get the, vac the hepatitis A outbreak under control. And I'll show you a slide in just a moment to see how effective that was. 
Uh, it's important that we don't have to serological test people before the vaccine. So there's no harm in giving a vaccine to somebody who maybe already had hepatitis in the past. It's not a problem. Uh, and so safe food practices and hand hygiene are super key. I years ago when I was working at a very large hospital, we had a we had a, an outbreak of hepatitis A, and it was really horrific. And it was all tracked ba tracked back to a um, a potluck a potluck meal that where somebody who had cooked food uh, had hepatitis A, obviously didn't have the best technique or hand hygiene, and a lot of people got infected with hepatitis A. And then of course. Our, our, our social our social challenges in terms of housing and homelessness. Um, the really the treatment for Hep A. There's no magical drugs. It's really just supportive treatment for a uh, treatment for symptoms. So it's symptom relief based on what symptoms the patient might have. And then it's it's just important to remember that we used to think of hepatitis A as being primarily a food and water transmission, but it, there is a huge, as we know, widespread person to person outbreak of hepatitis A. Uh, in the last couple of years. And I wanted to pull up this slide because I think it's, well, it's kind of, there's kind of some good news here is that these are the state reported hepatitis um, A uh, cases uh, as of 2022. And you can see in your state, you can see that Alabama is doing really well. Alabama has declared the outbreak over. So all of the gray states have declared the outbreak as being over. But you can see there are some states that are still significantly struggling. So there's Georgia, Tennessee, uh, Indiana, Missouri, uh, Arkansas, Louisiana, uh, Pennsylvania, still having significant uh, issues with hepatitis A. So you should congratulate yourselves and feel good about the fact that you were collectively able to get this under control because it was certainly no easy feat. And as you know, or Elena uh, told you that I, I worked in California and I've been in, I've worked in San Francisco and I've lived here since the early 80s. And yes, we do love our organic fruit uh, and we do grow a lot of it and it's delicious. But we do know that certain things like strawberries that are really difficult to wash without turning them into strawberry jam, uh, that there has there in 2022 this year, there, there was a significant outbreak of hepatitis A due to organic strawberries. So even though we like to eat healthy, sometimes we know that when we eat things um, that are contaminated, uh, we can see cases and California is leading the pack and not in a good way uh, in terms of this outbreak with 16 cases so far this year. So hepatitis A uh, is, again, it's something that is not does not result in a chronic carrier state. Most people who get it uh, do okay. It's not like they have chronic disease, uh, and it's certainly the best way to present to prevent hepatitis A is with effective vaccine vaccination programs. So let's move on to hepatitis B. So this is the most updated uh, information on cases of acute hepatitis B infection, and again, you can see the difference between the reported cases are the line, and then the estimated acute cases are the bars, and you can see that. Maybe there's a bright spot here. There's some good news in that hepatitis B, unlike hepatitis A uh, in the United States, uh, appears to be on the decline versus the increase. And, and if we take a look at, at your state of Alabama, your rates from, you, if you look from 2016 to 17 to 18 to 19 to 20, uh, it's really been stable, somewhere in that kind of 1.5 average rate. So. Not a, whole, not a whole lot of changes in the state of Alabama, but I know you watch this carefully and are acutely aware of this. Uh, and then this is just to showcase in Alabama that uh, in, in 2019, there were more cases than in 2020, which again, it's always the way we like to see things trending is better. Uh, again, uh, we, need to, we need to be reminded, and you know this, is that some of these are estimates, we calculate them, uh, and we know that there are a great number of cases that do not get uh, uh, reported. So um, this is just a kind of a showcase of cases per 100,000 population in the United States. And you can see where, where Alabama kind of is, um, is trending is, you know, not, uh, not the best, not the worst, certainly, um, but it's just kind of a, a way to be able to look and see how you're doing compared to other, uh, other states. 
Uh, and then in terms of the, um, the risk factors, behaviors, things like that, uh, for people that had a risk identified, and you can see what's interesting is no risk identified, a large number of people, but risk identified uh, injection drug use uh, is the leading risk factor, um, multiple sexual partners. There's some things on here that I think are worth underscoring needle sticks. You know, we, we've we stopped having the conversations about Sharpe's injuries in healthcare providers. Well, I shouldn't say we've stopped, but it's it's kind of taken a back seat. And we need to identify that Sharpe's injuries are still a risk factor for hepatitis B. And we know that healthcare providers should all be protected with vaccine, but we know there are vaccine um, gaps in our in our country, and clearly that's a problem. You know, dialysis patients, you're thinking, well, why are there why are people in dialysis getting hepatitis B? Hepatitis B is very prevalent in patients um, who are dialyzed, chronic hemodialysis patients. And we know that the hepatitis B virus, it can survive in the environment for like up to seven days. So we know that if there is virus in the, in the facility, it can be spread from person to person. So even though we have great cleaning practices and do all kinds of things to prevent the spread of hepatitis B in dialysis patients, uh, it can still happen. This is, um, this is totally preventable. And so we don't ever wanna see perinatal hepatitis B. We don't ever wanna see an infant contracting hepatitis B, but they happen. Uh, in 2020, there was one case in your state of Alabama and most states either didn't have any or it wasn't reported, uh, but you, know, there, there, you see California had one, Georgia had one, Indiana had one. Um, these numbers may not sound huge, but we know that um, this is a completely preventable event by making sure that every infant receives the hepatitis B vaccine, at least the first dose before they're discharged, and that we're screening mothers to make sure that if they are infected, that the babies are also treated with hepatitis B immune globulin. So these are the kinds of cases that we know we can prevent. And then this is just some, some data on the newly reported cases of chronic hepatitis, and there were not any reported in your state. And it's just kind of a smattering all over the place. So hepatitis B transmission. Primarily, I, th I think of hepatitis B for blood, B for blood. Blood is the primary source of transmission of hepatitis B. It can also be spread through uh, semen or other body fluids, especially if the other body fluids have have some blood mixed in them. Uh, but the primary modes of transmission are either a baby who's born to an infected mother, uh, a person having sex with somebody that's infected, uh, sharing equipment, uh, equipment, whether it's an IV drug user or medical equipment. This is why we're so tuned into cleaning and monitoring devices in the hospital and healthcare settings uh, like glucometers that we know could potentially get um, minute amounts of blood on them or multi-dose vials. There have been horrific outbreaks reported of hepatitis B uh, where people have used multi-dose vials uh, from one patient to another uh, and they've gotten contaminated and there's been transmission. It's not a high risk, but it's certainly theoretical that sharing personal items like toothbrushes or razors because they could have trace amounts of blood on them. Uh, and then again, inadequate infection prevention in healthcare facilities. So these are the primary modes of transmission of hepatitis B. The, the typical course, again, it can it's similar to hep A. It can be very mild, lasting a few weeks, or it could be serious. So hepatitis A does not have the lifelong chronic condition, but hepatitis B can. Symptoms, again, the same as I mentioned for hepatitis A. Uh, and what's really uh, disturbing is we know that more than 90% of infants who were not vaccinated, who get infected, will develop a chronic infection. And this is why vaccinating infants is so critically important, because we know it's the infants who are most likely, if they do get infected, to become chronically infected. They're not going to be able to clear the antigen. They can't make enough antibodies to get that antigen to go away. And these babies, these children, are going to have to deal with a chronic hepatitis B infection. Uh, six to eight, so contrast, um, older children and adults who get infected, 
between six and 10% of them develop chronic hepatitis. So if you put this in perspective, a child, an older child or an adult who, con who contracts hepatitis B, about you know somewhere around the 90% of them are gonna be fine. They're gonna be able to develop antibodies. The antigen will go away uh, and they will have lifelong protection from their antibodies that developed from the, uh, from the actual true infection. So we know uh, the risk factors of people with hepatitis B. Um, we know uh, uh, children that are born to mothers, sex partners of people who have the infection, men who have sex with men, IV drug, inject injectable drug users, um, household contacts or sexual partners of known chronic hepatitis B infected people, and then all of us as healthcare and public safety workers are, ex are potentially exposed uh, due to occupational uh, exposure. And then of course, patients on hemodialysis, just because of all of the blood and that many of the patients on dialysis do have chronic infection. So we know that there's a lot of virus kind of circulating. So prevention of hepatitis B, again, uh, just like hepatitis A is hepatitis B vaccination. It's a highly effective vaccine. Uh, we know it does require um, three shots over a period of time. Uh, many people get good protection from one, but three is three is, is the goal to get three injects, injections over time. Uh, we know that some people get um, hepatitis B vaccine and are considered non-responders. And these are the people that despite being vaccinated and maybe even getting boosted, they just don't respond when we test them and they don't have any detectable antibodies. However, these are people that are probably, if they were to get exposed to hepatitis B, say they sustain a needle stick and the source patient had hepatitis B, probably, at that point, the hepatitis B surface antibodies will kick in. Because, you know, we know our immune systems, you know, they can be kind of lazy. If they don't have to be working really hard, they're not. So uh, hepatitis B vaccination is highly effective. Um, safer sex. Notice I didn't say safe sex, but because I'm, I'm not really sure there is such a thing. But safer sex and using protection and using condoms and being careful, and then infection prevention um, practices, like I mentioned, things like uh, being really tuned into glucometers and things where there's uh, potentially some blood exposure. We have a lot of hepatitis B vaccines licensed in the United States, and I've listed them here. Um, I'm personally not familiar with some of these, but I just wanted to list them here for your reference, that there are um, the single antigen um, hepatitis B vaccines that are listed at the top. And then there's the three antigen hepatitis B vaccines. And then the combination vaccines, and these are for kids that the, we know the really nice thing about these combination vaccines is they cram a bunch of stuff in one shot, which is a fantastic thing to do. Uh, here, this, the, the Pediarix has hepatitis B, it has the diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, and then the polio vaccine all rolled into one. The Twinrix has Hep B and A mixed together, and the Vexellus has the the the, the, the diphtheria, tetanus, pertussis, uh, polio, uh, Haemophilus influenza B, and Hepatitis B rolled into one. I mean, I'm hoping one day, someday maybe, uh, there will be just a, be able to figure out a way to just have one or two vaccines that kids need and just cram it all in together. I know it's probably not going to be in my lifetime, but it's exciting to see that we have so many combination vaccines to just make it easier for providers. Um, when people ask me what vaccines do kids need, I'm like, I don't know, I gotta go look it up. I'm gonna pause because Elena's got her hand up. So it looks like we might have a question or a comment. Yes, so we've had a couple of questions that have come in um, in the Q&A and they're kind of pertinent to what you are talking about now. So um, I'd just like to pause and kind of address those questions. So one person asked, how long does it uh, hep A last in the environment? You know, I don't know. That's a great question. I, I don't, I don't know that it's been tested because it's not like hep B that can be on a little bit of blood. Uh, I don't know. Um, but I'm going to find out not at this very minute, but I'm going to look that up. Does it, and maybe somebody on the call knows. And if you do, Please pop that in the chat or the Q and A if, if if that's ever been studied. 
um, the Hep A survival in the environment. If anyone knows, uh, please enlighten us. Otherwise, I will certainly do some research on that. Thank you. So the next question is, is there a general idea of how many people with HBV are considered vaccine non-responders versus unvaccinated? It's a great question. I, you know, I, I don't know um, exactly. I know that it, in general, my experience is that the non-responders, um, people with a really high BMI and, and people that are chronic smokers, in my, ex ex my experience, have often been non-responders. Um, but I don't know how to break that down into a statistical amount of like what percentage of people are non-responders, but uh, not, not a ton, but, but, it, but there are enough people where it becomes, I think, a, a concern for people because people feel, oh my gosh, what's the matter with me? Why haven't I responded? And it just is that some people in the absence of a challenge or the absence of exposure, they just don't develop antibodies that are detectable. Thank you. And last question is, what is the benefit of three antigen hep B vaccine? So that's a great question. So, so what, when they, when they first studied the hepatitis B vaccines, they measured that although many people did develop a pretty high level of hepatitis B antibodies after they got one shot, then they tested, well, how many develop antibodies after two shots and then how many after three shots? And they were able to show a pretty dramatic increase, uh, which is why the series is recommended to have three shots, because even though you can get some protection from one, you get way more protection from three. It's kind of similar to maybe when we think about the COVID, you know, uh, and the COVID vaccines and the boosters, just kind of giving you a little bit more oomph, a little bit more protection. So I um, hope that answers the question. And it does. It does. And we got some answers in the chat box as well. Oh, good. Thank you, audience. And we got one more that came in in the chat. But what does it mean if, a, if patients are positive for HEP B, S, A, B, and also HEP B, S, A, G? I thought I'm going to I'm going to explain the hepatitis B surface okay. antigen and antibody that. Yeah, I got, I've got a couple of slides on that because that is always a, a befuddling thing. So I'm, I'm going to get to that in a few minutes. I will leave you to. That is it. Thank you so much. Okay. Great. Thanks, Elena. Oh, you guys are great. I'm glad I'm glad you've got these kinds of questions because when I do have any discussion like this and nobody asks any questions, I'm thinking, well, this is this isn't fun for me. And this is way fun when people have questions. And especially when I don't know the answer, because then that makes me go and learn some stuff. So thank you. So uh, treatment is really supportive based on the symptoms. And then there are some antiviral medications, uh, ten, ten, tenof, oh, I, I can never pronounce it, tenof, tenofovir, tenofovir, I can't even, yeah, T-E-N-O-F-O-V-I-R is the drug that I have seen used the most, but this is where it's really important that anybody who's being treated for hep B or hep C uh, is seen by an expert, by somebody who's a specialist in either uh, hepatology or somebody who's an infectious disease doctor, because they've got to be monitored really carefully. And what these drugs do is they help suppress the virus. They don't actually kill it completely, but they suppress it so that the virus isn't actively um, causing harm or wreaking havoc for the patient and causing long-term effects. So hopefully this is going to explain the difference between these. And this is, I would, again, remember I shared that, uh, that link to the CDC little uh, videos that explain the, uh, the testing. But let me kind of walk through, this is hepatitis B, and hopefully this will explain the difference between the surface antigen and the surface antibody and the core antibody, because they're, if I, hopefully I can explain this in a way that's going to make sense. The thing that appears when a person becomes infected is hepatitis B surface antigen. If the hepatitis B surface antigen is detectable, it means the person is infectious. They have the virus in their body. But what happens, most people, what happens over time, probably 90% of the time, not with infants, but with adults or older children, the surface antigen goes away because the surface antibody, the anti-hepatitis B surface, the antibody 
kicks in and neutralizes the hepatitis B surface antigen. So if a person has hepatitis B surface antigen detectable in their blood, it means they're, they're infectious, they're contagious. They have, they have active disease, active infection. If you test a person and they have hepatitis B surface antibody, it means it can be one of two things. It can either mean that they had hepatitis B and they recovered, so they have antibodies, or it could mean that they were vaccinated and they have surface antibodies. So he hepatitis B surface antibodies can mean either person had disease, but they recovered and they made their own antibodies, or they were vaccinated for hepatitis B. So you're thinking, well, it would be nice to know the difference. Well, how we know the difference is the hepatitis B core antibody. The core antibody is only detectable in a person who's actually been infected with hepatitis C. I received the hepatitis B vaccine. I have hepatitis B surface antibodies. I do not have hepatitis B core antibodies. You can only have these if you have been infected. So it's, a, it's an important test to be able to see why does this person have antibodies? Were they infected or were they not? And then the hepatitis B E antigen is a, a marker that the person probably has a, a more virulent and they're possibly more likely to have chronic infection. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. And I would refer you back to those, um, uh, those videos that I think are super helpful. Elena, I see your hand up. Um, was there a question about this? No, that was me not knowing how to use Zoom and leaving my hand up. So I will take it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Your hand must be tired. It's been up for a long time. Okay, good. I just want to make sure if there's another question. And then I've included this fact sheet, and this is a link to the fact sheet. And this is helpful, I think, to understand, again, hepatitis B surface antigen is positive, hepatitis B core antibody is positive. IgM, IgM is an indicator of recent infection. IgG is old, IgG for gone. IgM meaning I am infected, that's how I remember it. Uh, and then hepatitis B surface antibody. This is a nice little way to differentiate or to help interpret the results to see whether somebody is, is doesn't have it or if they're immune because they had a natural infection. Remember, the hepatitis B core antibody is only going to be positive in somebody who's who actually had the infection, not somebody who was vaccinated. Uh, this is somebody who was immune because of vaccination. Again, their core antibody is negative. And then acutely infected, chronically infected. So it's it, it, it takes time to kind of get these, get your arms wrapped around these. But I, I think those videos will help if you're still kind of uh, not not quite grabbing this. Believe me, it took me a long time to be able to really decipher this well enough to understand it. So let's move on to hepatitis C because we have another letter in the alphabet to cover. Uh, this again is a snapshot of reported cases of acute hepatitis C virus. And you can see um, this also had a pretty big uptick in 2020 uh, not, not really, um, not that, not that it was predictable, but not super surprising. So, um, let's look at Alabama. If we can, if we can compare 2016 to 17 to 18 to 19 to 20, um, you've been very stable. So you haven't been experiencing an uptick in terms of acute hepatitis C. Uh, and again, down here, you can see where your, your rates of 2020 were uh, less than your rates in 2019. So, um, so this, is a, this is a nice improvement. This is something hopefully uh, worth celebrating a bit. Uh, it's what we wanna see. We wanna see these cases um, on the downtick, not on the uptick, right? And then a hepatitis C infection, you can see where you rate in terms of the, the rest of the nation in terms of cases per 100 population. So Alabama is between 0 0.8 and 1.3 cases per 100,000 population. Uh, and then of course, this is just um, a, a, a snapshot of perinatal hepatitis C. So you did not have any cases reported uh, for, for um, 2020 for, baby, for mother to baby um, perinatal hepatitis C. And then the, um, okay, and, and then hepatitis C transmission. 
So this is, again, there's some similarities here, but when the blood, typically the blood of somebody who's infected with hep C, even in tiny, tiny amounts, gets into the body of someone who's not infected is how transmission takes place. Uh, equipment sharing, especially IV drug use equipment, needles and syringes. Um, receiving a blood transfusion or organ transplant prior to 1992, and if you're wondering what was magical about 1992, is that's when the screening of the blood supplies and screening of donor organs became hardwired. Remember, we, we didn't used to have a name for hepatitis C. We used to call it non-A, non-B hepatitis C because we didn't there, we knew there was some kind of other hepatitis, but we didn't have a name for it. So non-A, non-B hepatitis finally earned itself a letter, hepatitis C. And when we were able to start um, really systematically and reliably testing blood transfusions, we were able to exclude blood donors and not use that blood to transfuse. So prior to, prior to 1992, the majority of people in our country who got infected with hepatitis C got infected because they received a blood transfusion for something that we couldn't screen for. And now, uh, of course, we know poor infection control practices can be a risk factor, birth to an infected mother, and less common but, but possible. Um, hepatitis C uh, can be spread sexually, um, but not highly, typically, uh, and probably not all that transmissible by sharing, well, sharing personal items like toothbrushes, I don't think is ever a really good idea. So let's not even think about viruses. Let's just think about, ew. Uh, and then of course, unregulated tattooing where there's um, shared, it's kind of like a multi-dose vial of ink where the needles are double dipping, triple dipping into the same um, container, um, which is not a good thing because that's how people can get infected. You're obviously taking sharp needles that are gonna penetrate a person's skin and dipping it into a broth a virus uh, if it's gotten contaminated. Course of infection can range again from mild illness, a few weeks to serious lifelong or chronic infection, same kind of symptoms. So it's interesting, the hep B, hep C and hep A symptoms, well, they're similar because they all impact the liver. And then what happens is when we assault the liver, these are the kinds of symptoms that are typically seen. So they're same for all types of hepatitis. Um, what's really important, and this is where the disparity piece comes in, is at least half of people who have hepatitis C do not even know they're infected. So this is where we have to do a much better job in getting people screened, people that don't even know they have it because they, they don't know, they haven't been screened. Uh, and we know that more than 50% of infected people develop a chronic infection, hepatitis C infection. Uh, five to 25% of people with chronic hepatitis will develop cirrhosis uh, over the next couple of decades. And we know that hepatitis C is, is the leading cause of liver transplant and liver cancer. So when people say to me, gee, Barb, are there any vaccines for cancer? Wouldn't it be nice if there were some vaccines for cancer? I say, well, actually, yeah, hepatitis C, that it, if, if we had a vaccine for hepatitis C, that would be a cancer uh, a vaccine, which hopefully someday we will have a vaccine for hep C. Uh, human papillomavirus is technically a vaccine for cancer because it prevents uh, cervical cancer. So it's just, I like to think about things, things like this in a positive way. Hepatitis C, highest risk factors, uh, people with HIV infection, uh, uh, current or former um, IV drug users, uh, people on dialysis. And again, the, it's, this is, the dates are different based on when we started more reliably screening donors. So, um, screening transfusions, include, including the clotting factors, uh, organ transplants, or potentially from a donor who didn't test positive at the time of the donation, but tested positive later. And then of course, healthcare workers, EMT, public safety personnel are certainly all at risk. And then children born to mothers with hepatitis C infection. So vaccine development, um, it's, it's, It'll, we'll get there. I'm, I'm really hopefully we're going to get there with the molecular technology, but this virus just mutates like crazy. And it's really, it's been really difficult up until now to be able to develop a hepatitis C vaccine. But when we do, we will have another cancer vaccine because that is a, a big, big risk factor for people with chronic hepatitis C is liver cancer. And then of course, safe injection use. Yes, Elena, jump in. So we have one person wondering if we could see the prior slide. 
this one? I believe so. And then we had one other question. Um, with hep C, can someone have been infected years ago and have a flare up or symptoms currently? Or could someone have had mild symptoms early on and then months or years later have a flare up with all the markers elevated? Yeah, there, there can be some people that can have a kind of a, not a secondary infection, but very mild in the beginning and then over time and potentially triggered by other risk factors or another exposure uh, can, uh, can actually develop symptoms later in life. And typically that's when they go get screened. And people don't know to get tested for hepatitis C and that's what we as public health um, promoters of, of screening need to uh, be kind of screaming from the mountaintop is that people, people can't manage what they don't know they have. So yeah, that can definitely happen. Okay. And you know, all these vaccines and this recording will be available to you. So if, I, if I'm going through anything too quickly, I just want to make sure that I don't go over time. So that's why I'm kind of speeding through the, the rest of hep C. Treatment of hepatitis C, um, super, super important that the person be seen by an expert, uh, somebody who knows how to manage chronic liver disease, um, Again, making sure that if they have hep C, that they also have protection from hep A and, and B. Uh, making sure that they're not, not consuming alcohol because anything that's going to be an additional assault to the liver is a problem. Uh, and then making sure that we're screening them for other risk factors. We know if somebody's at high risk for hepatitis C because of injectable drug use, well, they're probably also at very high risk for HIV. So looking at the complete patient, but making sure that we identify the need for, and this, this changes like the wind. Um, more than 90% of infected people can be cured with treatment. So this is exciting news. This is really exciting that there's actually effective treatment for hepatitis C because decades ago, uh, it was, it could be, it could be a death sentence if you weren't able to get a transplant uh, in time to save you. So this is a really important slide, which just kind of showcases the need for being more, getting more active screening in people, especially people that don't have any reason to think that they might be at risk. Somebody who had a blood transfusion decades ago, they may not be thinking about hepatitis C. They were probably thinking about HIV, but not hepatitis C. So the universal hepatitis screening and screening people um, with recognized risk factors or even those that don't. Uh, is a really, really important public health um, activity, something that we, um, we're getting better at but need to continue to improve um, our approach to this. And then this is just a nice kind of show, and this, this, this will build on the little videos that I referenced earlier, but just how to interpret uh, whether or not a person is, um, uh, is, is infected or not uh, can, can help you just kind of interpret whether there's antibody detected, whether the infection is presumed, whether they are infected or they're not infected is based on whether or not the hepatitis C virus antibodies react or don't react. Uh, and then this is just a nice little kind of a flow chart algorithm that just goes through the whole antibody, non-reactive, no, no antibody, that's it, we're done. If there is a react reaction, do the hepatitis C RNA test and then based on whether it's detected or not, will tell you whether there's no current infection, so we're done, or do some more testing if indicated, or if they are currently infected, uh, make sure that they are referred to an expert who is completely up to speed on the latest and greatest. So, Barb, hey, what happened to the rest of the alphabet? Well, I don't want to cheat you and, and leave you thinking that there's only a hepatitis A, B, and C, because there are two other viruses, and I just want to mention them very briefly. Hepatitis D, uh, what's, what's interesting about hepatitis D, which we, we refer to as Delta virus, hepatitis B cannot exist on its own. It can only be present in somebody who's infected with hepatitis B. So if you're infected with hepatitis B, you can get infected with D at the same time, or if you are infected with hepatitis B and you get re-exposed, you can get hepatitis D later. And really what it means is it's just an additional assault and it's, it's an additional um, harm to the liver. So patients that are co-infected with both hepatitis B and D, D is like double trouble. Um, these people are possibly going to have more issues with chronic infections 
uh, if they don't clear their infection. So um, the only way to really protect yourself from hepatitis D is to, is to don't get hepatitis B. So vaccination for B also protects us from hepatitis D because again, it can exist on its own. And then there's hepatitis E, which is not very prevalent in the United States, but I just wanted to mention it because sometimes people ask this question, is that uh, it's not common here, um, but it does exist in other countries, uh, usually associated with eating, it's eating, hepatitis E for eat, uh, eating uh, things that are uncooked or raw, like pork, venison, wild boar meat, shellfish, um, that kind of stuff, uh, people can get infected by eating. So again, it, hepatitis E behaves um, very similar to hepatitis A. They're both uh, oral, oral ingestion is how people get them. So this is just my little cheat sheet when sometimes uh, people say, oh gosh, how do I remember these different uh, viruses? So A for eight, I ate something bad. B for blood, needle stick exposure or sex. C, and I couldn't come up with anything better than commonly, but commonly from previous blood transfusion or IV drug use. D, double trouble. You can't get D without B and it makes B worse. And then E, eat something bad, you get this. So that's just, you know, I need little memory aids because I, I can't get some of this straight sometimes. So um, I'm going to just... Um, Thank you. Uh, I am delighted that there was so much interest in this uh, in this topic, and um, you have given me some questions. Unless you know, it's possible, Elena. Did somebody have the answer to whether or not we know if hepatitis A can live on a surface in the environment, and if so, for how long? Per the CDC, how long does the virus hepatitis virus A survive outside the body? It can survive outside the body for months, heating food and liquids to temperatures of 185 degrees Fahrenheit for at least one minute can kill the virus. Exposing to freezing, exposure to freezing temperatures do not kill the virus. Wow, it can live for months? Yes. Oh my goodness gracious. Okay, well, that's why these viruses are going to be here long after we're gone. They are they are clever, hardy fellows. Absolutely. So any other questions in the chat box, Elena? We had some more questions roll in. And I know we only have five minutes. So um, I will go from the first one submitted. But for HCV, the uncommon cases of infection from sexual contact is the transmission from contact with blood during sexual intercourse, or is the virus found in vaginal fluids and semen? No, that that was studied, and I, it's probably more related to a blood exposure. I know that when, fail, when when partners are ca are counseled. So, for example, say there's a there's there's a there's a couple, there's a man and a woman, and the man is infected or the woman is infected, and the other is not. That they're counseled that there's probably no risk of transmission from vaginal secretions. Uh, or semen, uh, if you're in a relationship and you've been in this relationship that you probably don't, again, probably, probably, don't have to think about it as being a high risk exposure. So it's primarily, hepatitis C is primarily some sort of blood exposure. That can happen through sex, especially if there's any kind of ripping or tearing or bleeding, which can happen. Um, so it's, it's primarily the, the exposure to blood would be the hepatitis C contact. Thank you. And we got two questions that are very similar, but are there effective treatments for hep C similar to treatments for HIV? And then another person asked the same question, but even took it a little step further, but even if liver function tests are elevated. Yeah. So this is, this is where, and I am not an expert on the, the latest and greatest and what's, what's been tried and what hasn't been tried. Uh, but yes, there are absolutely um, ways to manage and treat he chronic hepatitis C or act or, or current. Yeah, that's, that's why it's really important to identify people that are actively infected, especially when they first get infected, because the sooner they get treatment, the better, the, the better they're going to be. In the very beginning, when it was first identified, there was nothing we could do, but now there are patients that are actually with adequate treatment and adequate monitoring are actually getting better, which again, takes us back to the importance of making sure that we are screening people, screening people, because I mentioned earlier, 50% of people who have hepatitis C don't even know they have it. If they don't know they have it, they can't be treated. And this is where we really need 
to be seen by somebody who is an expert in this field. So a infectious disease, hepatology expert who can actually monitor uh, the patient, especially for potential side effects, which as we know, any treatment could potentially have. I know there's one more question in the chat about how um, long C, Hep D, Hep E lasts in the environment. And I'm guessing the CDC probably has a lot of good information on that. And I, I don't think we have time for that question today because we're right at the hour. Okay. Um, but I would definitely point that person to the CDC um, for that information. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a ton of great resources on their website. And I'm, I'm positive the answer is there, Elena. So thank you. Yes. Thank you so much, Barb. We really appreciate it and learned a lot. And um, we are looking forward to, you know, having you back and, and hopefully we can um, continue this partnership. So thank you so much. Absolutely. It's been my pleasure. And thank you for challenging me and asking me questions I didn't have answers to. I love it. Thank you. <laughs> thank you, everyone. We'll see you next time.